Okay, it's seven o'clock for me. It's four o'clock for a lot of people on here. Um, and so I think I'm gonna just get started. Um, first of all, good evening, good afternoon. Um, I'm so excited to for the opportunity to speak here today um, and especially wanna um, thank Hillary um, uh, for, for asking me to speak here and to the whole team at UCSF for coordinating this fantastic lecture series. I'm looking forward to uh, viewing them um, as much as I can. So as we get started, um, first of all, I have no disclosures. Um, second of all, so the goal in this next 45 minutes to an hour is to provide a review of the anatomy, some small amount of embryology, um, the prenatal diagnosis and differential diagnosis, and the various stages of management for cloacal extropy. Um, I think the main goals is really the importance of knowing how this is the one, one anomaly that has the true meaning of multidisciplinary care. Um, and it's a very a stepwise approach, and I'll go through all those steps that I'm talking about. And the steps might not be linear, but there's definitely set stages in the, in the care. I do just want to mention that I am watching the, um, the chat list, and so please um, ask any questions or through the Q&A, and I'm going to be um, watching them on the corner. I also put a couple slides in between to remind me to stop, and we'll pause, and if you have questions at all, I'll, we'll go over them then if I haven't um, seen them previously. So as you all know, the extra free complex exists on a spec as a spectrum of disease from the most mild, which is epispadius, and this is actually a more sort of severe form of epispadius, but still the bladder's inside, to cloacal extrophy, with bladder extrophy sort of being in the middle of the spectrum. Uh, all of the extrophy epispadius complex is very rare. Classic bladder extrophy, which is the most common, is one in 30 to 50,000, with males more common than females. Used to be around two to one, but there's some reports that say it can be up to five or six to one as far as uh, incidence in males. Cloacal extrophy is um, not only the most severe, but also the rarest, which is lucky. Males are more common than females, to about two to one. Um, and it's also very rare, one, as far as formation, but two, about 50% of these will, uh, who are conceived will abort spontaneously. Um, and so that's why it's at a live birth. There are potential genetic and environmental factors. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, but there's been no clear um, association established thus far. So before we delve into cloacal extrophy, I just wanted to give a brief overview of bladder extrophy anatomy, um, just to put cloacal extrophy in perspective. So here you can see the male. Um, here's the bladder plate. Uh, the ureteral orifice is draining into the bladder. If you lifted this bladder up, you'd see sort of the striations of a bladder neck. Um, here's the vera montanum, just where it should be. Um, you see the urethral plate also displayed open. The corpora are, are behind here with the um, fused glands, although dorsally open, that corpora tend to be shorter and wider than a normal male. There's a wide and pubic diastasis. If you could feel right here and here, you'd feel that di diastasis. You have a very low set umbilical stalk, which once the stalk goes away, turns into a baby without a belly button. And you have a very anterior an anus. So in contrast to this, in cloacal extrophy, um, again, on that severe end of the spectrum, um, it's associated with an omphalocele, and I'll sort of repeat this again a little bit later on, but this is a baby with a very large omphalocele. Two bladder halves, because the hindgut, which is, here's the uh, board of hindgut that's supposed to be the large intestine but doesn't quite make it there, and the prolapsed terminal ileum come right down in the middle and separate the bladder halves. And then as far as the gonads, um, there are testes, this is a male, and here is a hemiglans with a Hemi set of foreskin, and on the other side, there's a corresponding hemi gland. So the genitalia are also split, just like the bladder halves are. In addition um, to the external anomalies, the, um, also there's changes to the bony pelvis, just like in classic bladder extrophy. Now, the unique features of classic extrophy are that shortened and widened anterior segment, the external rotation of the po uh, posterior pelvis. Um, and all of these are exaggerated, these findings are exaggerated, so that posterior pelvis is rotated even wider, 
the anterior pelvis is rotated even farther externally, leaving the pubic diastasis from an average maybe of three centimeters in a, um, a classic bladder extrophy to six to seven centimeters in a cloacal extrophy. So everything is again on that severe end of the spectrum. But just like in all things that we deal with and all anomalies, there are a variety of appearances um, along the spectrum. The emphalocele can have a variety of different sizes. This one's a very small emphalocele, which is the much more prominent sort of elephant trunk of the intussuscepted ileum. And this one also has a very small emphalocele. The bladder plates are almost fused over here and a very long um, uh, bowel segment. And here, uh, the bladder plates are almost covered with, with skin. And he doesn't have the elephant trunk, but he has that sort of just a board of uh, hindgut that's down in the perineum. So you can see a wide variety um, of, of variations in here. So I mentioned embryology, and now embryology is going to be very brief because mostly there's good theories, but um, you know we don't know exactly what happens. But we hypothesize that around the fifth week, when the um, cloaca, the common cloaca, is present and all um, the hindgut and the sort of the GU tract are all developing in the same place, uh, there's a cloacal membrane at the end. And during the sixth week, when that urorectal septum extends caudally down the, towards the cloacal membrane, it's supposed to be separating in the bladder uh, and the um, urogenital sinus from the hindgut. Now, the, in, the eighth week, in the eighth week, the cloaca is, divides those two seg segments completely, but in cloacal extrophy, that membrane, the cloacal membrane breaks down and then you have eversion of the bladder and the hindgut. Now the theory is that in classic extrophy uh, or classic bladder extrophy, it's a later breakdown in that membrane. So you already have separated the urogenital sinus from the rectum, so you don't really have the rectal anomalies and you only have the bladder, whereas if it's an earlier defect, then both the rectum and urogenital sinus and bladder are out. So looking at a axial cross-section, your bladder and colon should be separated, but once the um, the cloacal membrane ruptures, everything protrudes out and becomes uh, and pushed out so you can see those two extrophic hemibladders and the hindgut. So the associated findings. So one of the tricky terms, and I was just writing a, a paper about uh, prenatal imaging cloacal extrophy, and the, the real hard thing was, well, do I call it OEIS or cloacal extrophy? Really, they're one and the same. Um, OEIS is much more descriptive um, in that it, it, it accounts for all the, the components that we see in the OEIS complex, this constellation of findings, including an emphalocele, extrophy of the bladder, intestinal abnormalities, such as the eye, um, and these can include anal atresia, duodenal atresia, malrotation, uh, small bowel, short gut, and spinal abnormalities that occur in up to 87% reportedly. It can be anywhere from usually more of a covered lipomeningocele, can be a myelomeningocele or a tethered cord. There are other anomalies that are seen, um, renal anomalies, and I'll get into a little bit more uh, about the ectopia, but renal agenesis, a lot of these kids are born with a solitary kidney. They can have cystic dysplastic kidney fused and there can be hydroureter nephrosis. Even though you would think that if the ureter is draining into an open bladder plate, there's nothing in the bladder to make it open. Um, I just had to do cutaneous ureterostomy on a newborn. Uh, with severe hydroureter nephrosis. Um, intracranial anomalies was mostly associated with the myelomeningocele. Uh, lower extremity abnormalities uh, also associated with the myelomeningocele often. A hip dysplasia is quite common. And malarian anomalies in, in the majority of females, including vaginal agenesis, vaginal atresia, or duplication, and often uterine duplication. So as far as the intestinal uh, anomalies, there's a reported about 46% incidence of anatomic findings, as I mentioned, sort of malrotation, duplication anomalies, and 23 to 25% incidence of a functional short gut. Um, the important thing I think in here is to know that short gut syndrome and the appearance of short gut can occur even if you think or if it, it seems like there's a normal length of small bowel present. Um, and it's an absorptive dysfunction that is likely the cause um, rather than any uh, any other functional problem, but sometimes there's functional problems as well. And then regarding renal anomalies, 
This just came up also recently, so I'm highlighting it. In one of the largest uh, series today of 75 patients, there was a reported incidence of 14 to 17% of ectopic kidneys in, uh, in cloacal extrophy, much more than in uh, classic bladder extrophy. So we started looking at our series. Um, I work in a multi-institutional collaboration, and so we can pool all our numbers. And out of 81 uh, cloacal extrophy patients, uh, preliminary count showed 31 with uh, ectopic kidneys. Uh, so that is an important finding, um, which we'll discuss again a little bit more, but 38%, you have to be very wary of having an ectopic kidney when it comes to the second stage closure. So brief pause here. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, see if there's any questions. I don't see, let me make sure I'm checking the open questions. Um, and just want to make sure that there's no other questions. So I'll proceed now. So as far as the prenatal findings, um, mo so most of the time, first of all, the care of colloidal luxury will begin in the prenatal period. Occasionally you'll have a baby that's born, if have no prenatal care or lack of uh, uh, adequate prenatal imaging will be born as a surprise, as in bladder extrophy more often. But usually th there will be some very key findings on the fatal imaging. Initially, um, back in 98, um, there was a, a sort of the, the first presentation of the major findings that are associated with cloacal extrophy, including non-visualization of the bladder, an infra-umbilical abdominal wall defect, or, or cystic structure, because sometimes there would be a cystic structure preceding the lack of visualization of the bladder if it then ruptured, uh, finding of emphalocele and spinal abnormalities or myelomeningocele. Also, they reported on minor findings that might contribute to the diagnosis as well, including lower, lower extremity deficits, renal anomalies, which we've already talked about, ascites, widened pubic arches, which can be seen on, on fetal ultrasound, a narrow thorax, hydrocephalus, and a single umbilical artery. These are all nonspecific. Then, uh, in, to add to these um, set of findings, the elephant trunk or terminal ileum that is intussuscepted was described seeing a lack or not seeing a uh, meconium uh, down in the distal rectum indicates imperforate anus which goes along with the constellation and any sort of genital anomalies. So here's a, an example of a, a fetal image, a fetal MRI of a cloacal extrapy. So here you can see the emphalocele, you can see the intussuscepted short uh, small bowel, and you can see the very large myelomeningocele here. So it's classically, um, a classic findings that you would notice, and it, that was the imaging of this baby that you've already seen as, the, as an example. One thing to uh, be cognizant of is the differential diagnosis for both bladder extrophy and cloacal extrophy. And one of the things that can be uh, sort of, uh, misinterpreted for is an isolated emphalocele. So, he, these are actually all pictures of emphalocele that can look quite similar. Here's a giant emphalocele with a liver. Um, here's a, an emphalocele that has just bowel in it, and an emphalocele with surrounding ascites. Some things to note though, you see a bladder, at least in this one, and um, the umbilical cord is always inserting inferior to the defect, which means the defect is now superior, now inferior to the umbilical cord, which so it's not going to be the bladder. Um, but you can have uh, emphalocele um, and cloacal extrophy as in here, uh, but you're not seeing the bladder. So just something that can be uh, confused and it can be very tricky diagnosis. Um, and you know, your fetal imaging experts will help you to make that diagnosis. Um, on the flip side, you know, some kids are diagnosed with OEIS complex or mild spectrum of OEIS because they're seen as a bladder, um, seem to have a sort of protuberant mass, um, an infra-umbilical protuberant mass, say, well, this has to be an emphalocele, this has to be an emphalocele, when in fact, it's just a big bladder with bladder extrophy. And that diagnosis is important, normal anus, normal bowel function, um, it's a very, very uh, significant finding, uh, you know, differential in the finding. So, once the baby is born, that's usually when we get involved, except, you know, if many times we'll see these children prenatally and get to start to talk about the postnatal evaluation, but the rest of the workup begins once they're born. Of course, you start with the physical exam to evaluate exactly the anatomy that you're looking at. You're going to do an ultrasound, 
to look for the renal, uh, renal anatomy, and that's going to include looking for ectopic kidneys, solitary kidneys, hydronephrosis. If it's a female, you'll look for malarian structures, although usually they'll be difficult to, to identify an ultrasound because it would all be posterior to your bladder, and so you'll ultimately um, be looking for those later on, usually with an MRI. Spinal ultrasound or MRI, um, if, the def if the deficit is uh, or the defect is more minor, you might be going straight to um, an MRI um, or not need the ultrasound at all. Um, and imaging of the pelvis, usually just with a flat plate of the pelvis to look at the degree of diastasis. Many times if they haven't had a, a karyotype prenatally, you'll get a karyotype as well. Um, and in order to make sure that your physical exam confirms the genetic sex. So at this point, sort of, this is the start of the long journey. That is why sort of the stepwise approach that um, we like to talk about. And either stepwise or stages, and I have them listed here in numeric order, but by no means do they all occur in a nice linear progression. And sometimes you return to a step or you're stuck on a step for a very long time and you can't sort of advance. So stage one, in the first stage, the goal is to, uh, which this first stage, I should say, also uh, occurs usually within the first few days of life, is going to the, after you've done all the imaging, to separate the extrophic cecum from the adjacent hemibladders and perineum and close the bowel and bring up a colostomy. Now, in closing the bowel, um, that intussusceptive small bowel is put back inside. Often there's duplicated appendices that are, are often removed. And reconfiguring that sort of open plate of hindgut into a tube can be quite tricky. The, the tissue can be macerated. It can have, uh, you know, it can be very irregular. And you have to use all your reconstructive skills to get it into a tube to bring it up. Now, the goal is to make a colostomy. And over time, there's been multiple reports talking about never discarding the bowel tissue, either because it'll avoid GI losses and that, that small bit of hindgut will grow and can and work as a absorptive function. Um, otherwise, um, the uh, uh, hindgut, if it, if it proves not beneficial, can be used later on for bladder augmentation. Um, then during this first stage, we bring the bladder halves together. So in bringing them together, um, you're sort of filling in that gap as you close the fascia so they have nowhere else to go, um, and you're closing the rest of the abdomen and phallus if possible. Um, when you bring those, uh, I like to say sort of when you bring those bladder plates together, we do what Doug Canning, our chairman, learned from Bob Jeffs, which is he says, well, you know, if you look at something and you don't know how to fix it, turn it into something you know how to fix and fix that. So you make a cloacal extrophy into a bladder extrophy, and voila, you should be able to fix that. Not so easy always. Um, I just I apologize. I just wanted to, I did see a, before I go too far over, and I just finished the prenatal imaging, do you consider the fetal MRI mandatory in the workup? I think in most stages, um, the fetal MRIs can be very valuable, especially if there's any question in diagnosis. Fetal ultrasound, if done you know, very well with in expert hands, gives you all the same um, all the same details. I actually just am working on submitting a paper now that compared the findings from fetal MRI versus fetal ultrasound, and you have an expert ultrasonographer and radiologist was able to determine the same exact findings as the MRI, but fetal ultrasound is, I think it's much more user dependent than MRI, so most people will get the MRI to make sure of the diagnosis. And we can get back to that again. All right, so in the ideal world, and this is a book chapter, therefore, this ideal world. Uh, this is how the, uh, the closure looks at the end of that first stage. So now you, it was all preoperative, you had your bladder halves, your ileum, hindgut, and now at the end of that first stage, your two bladder halves are brought together. You have your ureteral stents into the two ureteral orifices. You've brought the genitalia a little bit closer together, and you brought up your colostomy. Um, what, a couple things uh, as far as considerations during that first stage closure, uh, and this is something I think I'm going to sound like a broken record um, because I'll repeat it multiple times, is the risk of undue pressure and tension when you're closing. There is a significant risk of compartment syndrome. Even if you don't close, in the past, um, 
you know, the goal was to close even the bladder all in the first stage. And that uh, could have devastating effects. But even if you're just trying to close an emphalocele when it's a huge emphalocele and there's not enough space, you risk compartment syndrome, which could lead to bowel ischemia, uh, renal loss, uh, especially of an ectopic kidney, the pressures in the pelvis, again, we're studying this right now, uh, that preliminarily, if you do a pressure monitor in the pelvic kidney versus the normal sort of orthotopic kidney, that pressure is a lot higher, so you can have renal loss. Um, uh, you can see ureteral ischemia, sort of that watershed area in between the, the mid and distal end, um, and, and uh, there have been reports of, of babies dying of this compartment syndrome. So you have to be very, very temperate on closing that abdomen, even though that's your goal when you get in there for that first stage. Sometimes if it's a huge emphalocele, so you have to use a silo to increase the abdominal capacity or some sort of other graft. Or the better part of valor sometimes is just to leave the emphalocele out while closing, you know, bringing up the colostomy, closing the, or bringing the bladder halves together and just wait um, until the child grows. So here is a baby who had a very large impalocele and it was all closed in one stage, just like the picture um, in the book, which was based on a, on a real picture. Bladder halves, one side is much bigger than the other, just two ureteral orifices. The genitalia on him are still quite wide apart, bringing the, the sort of the dead space in the middle from where the bowel was and your colostomy. Um, and admittedly, this baby did have quite a lot of, of troubles with um, uh, uh, feeding later on and ended up having some um, ischemic segments or, or narrowed segments in the small bowel that might have been natural or ischemic, we don't know. Um, conversely, this is another baby with a very, very large emphalocele. And at the time of the closure, it just wasn't feasible to, to close this. So brought the bladder halves together, um, the colostomy is over here, and then just let her be. She also had a massive, massive lipomeningocele. You can see here, which I haven't been able to show you yet, is one sort of a vaginal plug and the other vaginal orifice, and this is a female. And this is just another example to show another um, first stage uh, closure of a not so great, a not so big uh, emphalocele, bringing the bladder halves together, um, this very large prolapsed ileum, and bringing a colostomy up and the two bladder halves here. As you can see, this, this female has the sort of bifid uh, labia uh, here and a vaginal orifice in here. There is a comment, oh, what about ileum, ileal prolapse? So this prolapsed ileum, you, um, I don't know if I'm uh, understanding the question perfectly, is you push it back inside, sort of putting a sock inside out and leave it in. And then um, you, if you were not able to bring up a colostomy, you can bring up an ileostomy. Um, but the goal is to try to bring up a colostomy. But please, if you, if I didn't um, uh, answer that, please uh, clarify that a little bit or, or, or probe me a little bit more on that. Um, so uh, moving along, then just this last one. And I'm showing you all these pictures um, just to give an example of the variations that you see, um, and everyone looks a little bit different. They're all general, you know, variations on the same theme, but I do think that all of them look a little bit different. Another um, small emphalocele, um, sort of much more uh, tight, uh, tight appearance, and platter halves came together very, very nicely. This uh, this child had the prolapsed um, uh, ureters. That, were, that came out and over time, sometimes you can have massively prolapsed ureters that you then have to deal with uh, at the second stage closure. So now that you have all these first stage closures, feel great, it's in the first week of life, but this is now the critical time and the hard time of growth and development and nutrition. Um, this is the time that uh, we find a lot of these uh, babies have a shortcut physiology, either, again, whether it's a true defi deficiency of length of the je jejunum or ileum, or if there's skip lesions, as that uh, child who I mentioned with the large emphalocele you'll have, uh, we're not quite sure, or is it an absorptive capacity? Um, parental nutrition is very common in these, and it might have to be long-term, and the goal is not to rush here, uh, because sometimes they'll start to feed, and then 
even though they're feeding, they're not gaining weight. And so just because they're up to their normal feeds, all right, you're taking 40 ounces, or not 40 ounces, 40 mLs or 60 mLs or whatever it is at a time, if they're not absorbing the fats, they're not going to grow. And there are, they can be um, uh, differences in, um, uh, in their biliary tree that can prevent absorption. So that's something that we focus on a lot. Um, also, later on, um, as they are growing, a lot of them with the colostomy will have colonic stenosis and require colostomy revision. And being aware of potential colonic stenosis, either at the skin level, fascia level, or a little bit more proximally, is very important. Because remember, you've taken that hind bed and you've tubularized it, but as I said, it could be sort of ratty tissue. Um, Dr. Maklich once said, can't make a purse out of a sow's ear. And sort of think about that every time is you really are trying to make a person of a sow's ear um, and bringing that all together and uh, that that tissue might not heal well and so you might have uh, um, have some problems there and have need revisions so again always just trying to keep it in mind um, so part of stage three is the spinal surgery um, usually you have the spinal imaging at birth uh, the neurosurgeons might want to get um, an M MRI to further evaluate the findings on ultrasound or not. If it's a closed defect, generally just as in any baby with any closed defect, at least our team likes to repair it around three months of age. Um, the important thing to remember is that these spinal defects can affect later reconstruction plans because essentially depending on the degree of spinal uh, defect, you have functional myelomeningocele along with your colloidal electropy. So expecting normal function of the bladder is limited, expecting normal function of the bowel is limited, and for the idea or the um, planning of potential pull through, you have to remember that they're going to have neurogenic bowel and bladder. And so most of these kids um, will stay with a colostomy. So once you've done all these things, uh, it's time for the bladder closure, and once a child is ready. Now usually that's between one to two years of age, um, and but it can be much longer and I think that here as in all things patients is, is really essential um, because you really want to wait until that nutrition um, and is 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 good the, the child is big enough um, in the meantime as long as the bladder and the ureters are draining you have nothing to worry about keep the bladder plates covered and they'll they'll be totally fine um, in the second stage, one, some of the things that we focus on for pre preparation is the spinal uh, or the, sort of the bony pelvis anomalies. So as I mentioned before, the pubic diastasis and colloidal atrophy is almost twice the size, um, twice the distance as in classic ex bladder atrophy. And as the kids grow, it gets bigger and bigger and they truly really, really have a flattened pelvis. And so uh, these, you tend to do a staged osteotomy approach to gradually bring this in because you're never going to get it all together in one. And so usually around three to four weeks prior to your planned bladder closure, the, the child will go to the operating room with orthopedics and at that time you should put an external fixation. And then every few days they start to crank it closer, usually under anesthesia, um, and uh, bring it closer and closer and closer until then at the time of your bladder closure, you might be able to um, bring it at least much more close to uh, approximation. Um, just a question here. Um, what do you cover the bladder plate with prior to bladder closure? So my favorite is actually just press and seal. Um, the families seem to love it. It's uh, like it better than regular saran wrap or plastic wrap because it has a little more body to it and you can put it on. Um, in the hospital, we're no longer allowed to have press and seal because um, I forget the reasons, but there's uh, fancy reasons. And so they have like, um, uh, we can use Tegaderm sometimes, but sometimes the stickiness of that irritates the skin. And there's um, a, a kerosene, a care dress type, uh, uh, used to be called Vigilon that we used to have. There's like a, almost like a, a gel, a, a couple millimeters thick gel that places on it. I've had a couple of kids that the families really didn't like that gel though. They felt like um, the bladder got a little more friable and um, a lot more rashes. And so I just tell them as soon as they go home to start using the press and seal. Um, so intra-op considerations um, for the second stage bladder closure. Again, very, very tempered aggressiveness. And uh, 
here again here, as I said, it's going to be a broken record here, risk of increased abdominal pressure and compartment syndrome. Um, so important things to think about is your NG uh, decompression um, uh, after surgery to keep the bowels as decompressed as possible. Maximum drainage of the kidneys and bladder with as much tubes as you can. Um, watching the kidney pressure during as you're cranking that pelvis closed, if you have a pelvic ectopic kidney, um, watching to see, make sure that you're, you're still getting urine output from that kidney um, and watching it afterwards to make sure that the pressure isn't too high. So you can get a lot of different um, uh, uh, complications, uh, including bladder dehiscence. So whole thing falls apart, just like you can classic extrophy, uh, abdominal compartment syndrome, as I, I mentioned, progressive renal dilation and renal function loss. Uh, and that's just a name, just a very few of them. So I'm going to give you some examples. Um, and these are all the same people you've already seen, but just now after the second stage closure. So initial after the first closure, as you can, I said, um, sometimes you can get pretty severe ureteral prolapse. And this, and this child definitely had that. We're able to actually excise a lot of the ureteral prolapse in order to um, get to the base of where the bladder met the ureteral prolapse and then um, uh, form this into a sphere and, and, close, uh, and close him. You can see the ureteral stents still coming out here, the urethra here. You know, when you have such a large defect and very small, um, small uh, corpora uh, and glands, you don't really get too much of a true urethra, but sort of just bringing the, the bladder neck out to the perineum. Um, as much as you can. And so you can see here pretty well, well, he still had the suprapubic tube, and then once it's about a year out, pretty well healed. Scrotum is here, um, and it just leaks from, or, or leaks from right here. Another example um, of the one with the smaller emphalous heel, so smaller defects, smaller pubic diastasis, much more prominent uh, glandular uh, structure that you can see here. Um, this is again about a year uh, after the first stage. Um, bladder plates look nice and healthy, and uh, the two corpora down here, and then brought him together, um, well healed, and you could see this, the very small bit of, of glance tissue, but he definitely does have some glance. And then you remember the, the baby that we mentioned earlier, so you could see here that we said, hey, we can't close this hole in the phallus seal. It's just too small, um, and not, not enough space for this. Well, she had a very rocky course. She actually ended up transferring away, um, had myelomeningitis closure, had a very rocky course. Her uh, very severe malnutrition could not gain weight. She's now finally, um, not in this picture, but she almost looks identical to this now. She's now four years old, uh, 24 pounds, and finally is eating, uh, still NG fed in addition to eating, but now is robust, has, um, you know, has grown big, and now we're ready to ta tackle this. But in the time, because that emphalus is never uh, closed, it sort of weighted down and sort of separated our, our bladder halves that were, you know, closer, at least approximated. Now they're wide apart again. Here you can see the uh, vaginal orifice here and here. Um, she's going to basically need an entire redo first stage, starting with uh, an emphalus closure um, that the plastic surgeons will be, uh, will be, uh, conducting um, probably with either stratus or um, tissue expanders to make sure that she has enough abdominal um, real estate to get all this bowel in there. And then at the end of that, if either at the first stage or, or when this is closed or right after, we'll just bring the bladder plates back together and start from scratch. Let that heal and then go on to talk about closing the bladders. Um, here is another girl that these images are not not great, but just to go to show that this second stage, or, or sorry, fourth stage, um, doesn't need to happen one to two years. It can happen anytime if it's going to happen. Um, she had was born with significant short, short gut pathology. Um, they never quite could figure why she was evaluated for a renal tran uh, small bowel transplant. So of course she never. This is her after her first stage. These are her bladder halves. This was her at around. Oh, sorry, not yet. Um, uh, around four years of age, um, with this sort of clitoral structure in the middle of the bladder halves, very, very beefy red bladder halves, good urine output, never did anything. And then this is here at nine years, five years later, she came back, um, at, again, still being um, 
uh, you know, fed for G2, very still, her nutrition isn't perfect. These are her bladder halves now. Huge, huge bladder halves. But she's just never quite met the criteria to start closing her and, and closing the bladder. I think now she's finally getting close to it, but she's nine years old. So I'm going to take another quick pause. I think we've been pretty good about um, the chat and the questions. Um, but yeah, saran wrap uh, is, is the, I think, the best thing to, to cover things with, just to go back to those. Um, so as far as the, I wonder if I can get a better picture of, um, so a couple of things here. Uh, so first of all, as far as the, the um, uh, I, what are the intraop signs that I see um, for the, if the abdominal pressures are too high while closing. So that is, well, closing, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. One thing you can do for the abdominal pressures is we started just literally putting a catheter in to uh, uh, like a umbilical artery catheter up, up the ureter into the kidney and transducing it with a A-line transducer and having anesthesia just read off a pressure monitor and you can measure the pressures. We're still experimenting with that, but um, overall you can just look at uh, increase abdominal pressure, make sure the um, ventilation pressures happen, you know, the uh, peak pressures haven't increased, make you check with your anesthesia colleagues, make sure that they haven't seen any changes. It is hard to know like, how much pressure is too much pressure for the kidney. Um, in classic extrophy, we worry not so much about a kidney, but for the penile uh, perfusion, we'll close the pelvis very slowly and we'll actually keep on putting a needle into the glands to make sure it's still bleeding. And you can see that it stops bleeding when you have closed the pressure too much and you open the pelvis up a little more and it starts bleeding. So it's all the same principle. Admittedly, the, the kidney is a really, really hard one to check the pressures. Um, so uh, other comments are, what are your criteria to close the bladder? Really, a lot of it is has been um, uh, the nutritional status. Um, and as long as the uh, nutritional status is good, doesn't matter how big or small the bladder is, uh, you can close it. Just like in an extra fee, if you have a tiny little bladder, you know, as once you've freed it all up, take it off polyps, you can, a bladder that's two by three, you can easily close, not easily, but you can close it. And many times they'll grow. And so we don't really look at the bladder plate size as a criteria, but more overall, how is the baby gonna tolerate the whole overall surgery? the osteotomies and everything like that. Um, for delayed vaginal reconstruction, uh, definitely, and I actually have a slides that I'm gonna to get to about that, so I'm gonna, I'll address that in just a minute. Um, and then the last thing is, sort of the hindgut reconstruction, I wish I can draw on a, on a whiteboard right now, because that is the sort of the trickiest part of it in that you have a, basically a flat tube or a, a, a tube that isn't a tube, it's a flat plate, and then it ends as it sort of it connects to the, the terminal ileum, which is now intussuscepted. So once you put the terminal ileum back in, you have a tube leading to a flat plate. And that whole flat plate has to be peeled off of the perineum. And then once it is, you have a very, again, jagged, irregular flat plate that you have to tubularize, but the, the, the part that is the, Usually the hardest is where that hindgut is meeting the, the terminal ileum. And that's where we once coined some, um, a phrase, like a, I don't know, it wasn't, it's was probably something that was well known as like a T incision, because you have to really make it like a hindgut to in two different directions to get a, this flat tube joining into the circular, um, sorry, this flat plate joining to the circular tube to make a lumen that's gonna not be obstructed. So you just, whatever means possible, have to tubularize it, but it really is peeling that whole hindgut off of the perineum intact, um, which is usually the general surgeons who are doing that, but this is also stressing the importance of why urology has to be there with them. Say, hey, you know, we have to preserve this, we have to bring this up as a colostomy. Um, that was not the best explanation, I apologize. Um, I can look up for you the normal range of the pressures from the kidney through the umbilical catheter. I don't have it offhand, um, but I have that. And we also did 
uh, in a study conducted in uh, Wisconsin primarily. Lizzie Roth is writing that up, and she has the bladder pressures. Um, it was Wisconsin and Boston who have done them. Uh, the bladder pressures and also did um, ultrasound, Doppler ultrasound, and looked at resistive indices during the closure. So I can get you some of that. Um, so moving on just a little bit, and then we'll get to the rest of the questions. Um, so continued care. Um, there's still a lot, as I mentioned in the beginning, this needs a ton of multidisciplinary care. It's not just, oh, you, you know, we close the, the gut's fine, the bladder's fine. These kids, again, with their myeloma ninja seal, they have a lot of psychological uh, challenges, they have physical challenges, and the constant GI nutrition challenges. So really, from an early age, we stress having the patient and family meet with a clinical psychologist. Um, it's important in the earlier ages, not so much for the kids, because they do great. That little four-year-old who has her emphalocele is wide open. Cutest thing, just talks and flirts with you and doesn't have a care in the world. But for her mom, it's a really, really challenging uh, experience that she's waited this long. She's trying to get her, her child to grow and have nutrition. So this, this clinical uh, the support system is really, really key. And for these children, uh, especially in adolescence, it's crucial to have the clinical psychologist a partnership because a lot of things that these kids won't necessarily talk to us about, but they will talk to someone they feel comfortable who is not their surgeon necessarily. Um, you know, sometimes we can have great rapport. Also for some of the older kids that you'll meet that maybe had this all 15, 20 years ago, especially if there was gender reassigned, um, they will have a lot of challenges. And so having that clinical psychology support is essential. Physical therapy is also very, very important. Um, there's various degrees of spinal dysphagism. So you really have to improve their mobility as much as possible, if, if they can be. And just as a side note, we're doing this for all our physical, our bladder extrophy group because we feel like it can help incontinence. Now again, in cloacal extrophy, it's much less likely to help incontinence there. Um, and for GI and nutrition, um, it all comes back to nutrition. Nutritional help, health uh, enables any future surgery that you want to do because if you don't have the nutrition, you're never going to heal from the surgery. And so that's why I keep on you know, going back to this nutrition, nutrition. Um, so let's see here. Wanted to just uh, touch on the other differences um, that might come up. So this was a girl, actually, I met her when she was, I think, 12 or 10. And she had um, left kidney, right kidney. She had two hemivaginas, as I mentioned, the malarian structures can be duplex, two uteri. She had a very small bladder with a ureter draining into it. But each of these vaginas formed a stone. And earlier on, I think it had been thought that it was a bladder stone. Uh, but then we went in, and I still remember, I, this is not the, the first shot, should have had the KB shot for you, just these two radiolucent um, uh, stones uh, filling the entire vagina. It was one of the most fun cystolotholopaxies I've ever done, going to one vagina, clearing out the stone, going to the other, because it had very narrow necks. Now, uh, very tiny bladder and, um, and, and dilated ureter. So I don't have other slides on her, but just the follow-up is about seven years later when she was 16, she had been still wet the whole time. She was working on nutrition. She uh, uh, was an artist and she finally decided, she's like, I'm, I'm ready to be dry. And so we assembled a team, Dr. Canning um, assembled a team of general surgeon, plastic surgeon, three of us, uh, I, I worked with him as well as our adult reconstructive surgeon who works with us in all our transition patients and uh, orthopedics, or, no, orthopedics wasn't there. Sorry, so it was our team. In a 17 hour sort of tour de force, we, uh, first of all, just with general surgery, got into her be um, belly after, uh, you know, other surgeries that she had had with her colostomy um, and everything, freed up the bladder. Her bladder plate was just maybe six, six centimeters by two, three centimeters, freed that up, reimplanted the ureter still into the bladder plate, um, which is, a, you know, uh, just to use that as a as a, a base, augmented uh, did a small bladder augment, did a, a Monty, and closed the two um, hemivaginas after freeing the bladder off, so that they would um, so that they were separate from the from the bladder because they there had been an opening 
during the dissection and from the vagina to the bladder to close the two separate hemivaginas. The only thing we didn't address at that point was the, the two separate hemivaginas and the, um, uh, and the bladder, but now the bladder is lifted up and away, so eventually when she does want something done, we can bring those two together and potentially create one vaginal orifice for her. Um, but that was the long-term follow-up on her. I apologize, I don't have other pictures for her. So, well, that comes to this next slide, which is continent surgery. So this can happen uh, very varied timings. That girl was 16 when she was ready. Um, and timing does base, uh, is very much based on the child, on the parents, and on the social setting. You know, um, it requires, in almost all cases, a bladder net closure, augmentation, catheterizable channel. I have a, or had, I, about five years ago, I met a 33-year-old patient who had been seen for years before. I think we were around the same age at the time. Maybe she was a year younger. And she said she voided with continence. And she said she was a cholecholectrophy. You know, it's hard to get the um, charts from back then. Um, but you know, she had a colostomy, so I do believe it. And she was voiding with complete continence after having only one surgery uh, in the past. So I think it might be possible in the right setting with a small, you know, minimal spinal defect. But definitely based on counseling, I wouldn't say that that was the norm um, and that most of these kids will require complete reconstruction. And then I mentioned earlier sort of the rectal pull through that is usually quite rare because they have neurogenic bowel, loose stools due to um, very small amount of, of hindgut and, uh, and small bowel pathology. And with the myeloma meningocele, if they don't have a functioning uh, anal sphincter, then you wouldn't want to necessarily give them a perineal colostomy. And so most of them are poor candidates for a pull through and will, and will stay with their colostomy. So um, before we get to the final questions, uh, I just want to sum up and then we'll get to them, I should say. Um, Hopefully, in all of this sort of stress that the care of children with cholecal extropy really begins at that prenatal visit um, for the diagnosis, and there's a lot of counseling that goes on there, and lasts a lifetime. Um, it's a early, or the focus on the early nutrition is critical for every second stage you want to do, every subsequent surgery you want to do. The stage surgical approach um, can potentially avoid very devastating complications. And now that patients are living into adulthood, you know, we're really learning more about the long-term challenges and seeing what is important for them and trying to investigate better what's, what are the things that we can do that won't necessarily make us feel better, but will make them feel better um, throughout their lifetime. And so uh, this was a shirt or onesie that one of my uh, patients had made, um, but we just have to change it to Chloe Clock Street, which is a little worse. Um, so I'm going to put the summary slide here. That This is just a thoughts with a survey, but I would happily take any other questions because we have about 13 minutes uh, left. And I'm going to look over here to see if we have other ones. Um, all right, so going back to the top, um, should cloacal extreme patients be treated at centers of excellence before or after the first stage closure? Now, that's always, a, I think, a, a hard question for me because I don't want to say, oh, sure, they have to be at a center of excellence because I feel like, well, if I happen to be at one, it sounds bad. Um, but I do think that they're very, very challenging patients. And it's not just having the one surgeon or the one general surgeon or the one urologist who knows how to take care of them, but it's having the entire team. Um, and, you know, for a cloacal extrophy, that newborn time period is so crucial. Um, and, you know, even having all the team in a, in a center of excellence, not everyone is on the same page. Not everyone has the same thoughts about it. So you have to have the intestinal rehab team to really be thinking critically, the nutrition team to make sure the TPN is perfect. You have the um, ostomy nurses, so, you know, the colostomies don't work at first or they're leaking all over. So it's really that whole team that you usually will get uh, at a tertiary care center or a center of excellence that will add to the patient's care. Um, but you know, if you have all those things, I think that's, that's great. As far as the second stage closure, again, you need all that support system. The, the, the general surgeon and the plastic surgeon to help with the um, phallocele, um, the physical therapist, the orthopedic surgeons, the, the care for all of them. And I think that's where the real challenges come in. Um, do you do bladder augmentation in all patients or most of them? I would say 
you know, for cloacal extrophy, I'd say most of them end up, once you're closing off the bladder neck, end up with an augmentation. The tricky thing is a lot of these, if they do have short gut physiology, you don't have much small bowel to work with. So on that 16 year old that I was telling you about, we measured to the centimeter how much we thought we can sort of uh, use and get away with with the Monty and the Augment because if you take too much of her small bowel away, then she's really going to be uh, hit with nutritional issues. Um, that's when also having the hindgut, if it's not functioning well for, for the patient, could be used for the bowel. Although I will say that a couple of the kids that are not old enough yet to know, um, if their bladder happens to grow, a couple of the ones I showed here, I felt like they have very robust bladder plates. If it happens to grow, you might be able to get away with closing the bladder neck and seeing how and putting a catheterizable channel and seeing if it'll grow, but it's hard to tell. Um, double barrier or I don't know what a umid colostomy the option. Um, you know, for a shortcut, uh, as far as the, the you know the colostomy, I think you only have what there's such a little bit of hindgut that you barely have enough to bring up. And so later on, if it grows, you can change the colostomy, but I'm not quite sure there. Um, an ileal chimney at the time of bladder closure is a very, I think, a good idea. Ileal chimneys, I think some people have concerns that they don't always drain very well if you have a low pressure system. I think they're great for a neurogenic bladder with a high pressure system that pushes it out. Um, but I think depending on your experience with ileal chimneys, it would be reasonable. Also, the you know, the patient's willing to have a second a second bag, which I think also, often they would be. Um, if you have short bowel, what do you use to augment the bladder? It's very, very hard. Um, it's either going to be, you know, you don't, if you have a little bit of extra hindgut that happened, if the patient happened to have a little bit extra or had grown over time, you might be able to use that or just a very, very small amount of small bowel. But that's where, you know, you're in a rock and a hard place on a lot of these. Um, are there any other questions? Just looking at 751. Just want to make sure I have all the chats. Um, I'm hoping I didn't miss any of yours either. I apologize if I did, if I scrolled past it and I, and I missed it. Um, but I will be getting a list of questions, I think, from, uh, from Michelle. And so I'll be able to um, and so those updates on how close we are to tissue engineering, bladder for augmentation, unfortunately not. Um, uh, uh, I think that Tony Atala was a VP, uh, but I missed, I missed his lectures. Um, I think he would be the one to, to have any updates on that, but unfortunately I don't. Um, have I used saran wrap for coverage? Definitely, just regular saran wrap. Um, you can definitely use. I just find that it's so, it clings, it's sort of, uh, when you take it out, it just sort of likes to crumble a little bit, so it doesn't have as much um, uh, sort of body as the press and seal, but saran wrap is good. Um, I think that there was a paper a couple of years ago looking at sort of brand name saran wrap versus plastic wrap, and there's a different component in the two, and they were looking at polyp uh, development um, between the two. Essentially, uh, I, I don't think that there's too much of a difference as long as it's a smooth coverage to protect the bladder plates from um, from the diaper and anything that like cloth or, or rough that would irritate them and grow more polyps. Um, what about ileum? Uh, no. Okay, I think that's about it then. Um, it's a little bit early, but I'm sure no one will mind. Um, and please let me know if you ever have questions. I forgot to put my email on here, um, but I think it's. Uh, you, if you uh, contact Michelle, I'd, I'd be happy for any of you to have my email. I'm happy to, to discuss things uh, offline at any time. Thank you so much for your attention and um, good luck. And I look forward, as I said, to hearing the other, um, other talks that are going to come up.